Welcome. This is part three of my video series giving a scientific rebuttal to the points made by Ben Davidson in his 2014 talk to the Electric Universe Conference. In part one, I dealt with his claims that carbon dioxide plays no significant role in global warming. In part two, I dealt with his insistence that it is in fact the sun that is causing global warming. In the next part of his talk, he reverts to the old argument that the whole solar system is warming and thus global warming must be being caused by an external force and not changes in the Earth's atmospheric composition. Finally, Ben goes completely off the rails by making an attack on the integrity of most scientists and makes a bunch of false claims about the peer review process. I want you to particularly notice how consistently inconsistent he is throughout the video. For example, he often quotes papers to support his case, but without realizing that those papers often completely undermine the points he's trying to make. At 2105 into the video, he makes this statement. If this, meaning global warming, is driven by the sun, then it is truly a solar system shift. Now, on this point, Ben and I can agree. But the question comes, is the whole solar system warming? I've already done a series of three videos on this, the links to which are listed below. And Ben wisely stays away from the points I made in that video. Ben goes on to say that we had better see evidence of this everywhere. And again, we agree. The problem is there is no such evidence. To prove this, you'd have to have all eight planets, all 174 moons, and all the other objects in the solar system warming on the same time scale and at the appropriate rate as the Earth. However, there's only one planet that is warming globally and on the same time scale as the Earth, and that's the Earth itself. Ben goes on to describe a lot of changes in the planets, but a change in a planet is not necessarily the result of warming. He makes this inconsistent argument consistently throughout the rest of the video. To show that a given change is the result of warming of a planet, you have to go through quite a rigorous process. It requires that the warming be of the appropriate magnitude to cause the change. It also requires that the change has been taking place on the same time scale that the Earth has been warming due to global warming, i.e. over the last 30 to 40 years. Nor can you claim it as settled science if there are alternative explanations or counterexamples. To do this, you generally need a long and detailed history of a planet's climate, which generally is not available to us. Well, let's start with Venus, as Ben suggests where a paper by Katuntsev in 2013 has suggested that Venus's high altitude and high speed winds have just got 33% faster. Ben offers no explanation as to how these increased wind speeds are explained by solar warming. The data used in this study comes from the ESA mission Venus Express, which was launched in November of 2005 and arrived to orbit Venus in April of 2006. So this paper covers the time scale from 2006 to 2012. But wait a minute, isn't 2006 quite a time after the time when Ben claimed that global warming on the Earth ceased? So why should Venus continue warming when the Earth has stopped? Meanwhile, another Venus expert is claiming that what these authors are actually seeing is a change in the formation altitude of the clouds, not actually the propagation of the clouds themselves. So the velocities they are measuring are wrong. So what can we conclude from this so far? First of all, the Russian study has not been confirmed by any other uh, researchers. The change in the wind speeds are not on the same time scale as the Earth has been warming. As we've seen, there's an alternative explanation. And the last nail in this particular coffin is that the Earth's wind speeds have not particularly increased as a result of global warming. So increasing winds is not a signature of global warming. Ben then goes on to talk about a Russian result that claims that the long-term increase in solar irradiance is heating both the Earth and Mars. But we already know that total solar irradiance has not changed significantly during the periods of global warming on Earth. Now you could suppose that Mars has some sort of climate lag, however it has no atmosphere or oceans to help it with that. And in fact, any small changes in solar irradiance would produce massive changes on Mars instantly. If we look into it, Adas Matsov is a fairly interesting character. He denies that carbon dioxide is even a greenhouse gas. And he hasn't found very much support for his ideas. Amato Evans from the University of Wisconsin says that his uh, ideas are not supported by the theory or observations. And Colin Wilson of Oxford University points out that most of the changes in Mars's climate is being caused by changes in Mars's orbit. 
So once again, we have the wrong time scale. The melting here was occurring between 1999 and 2005, and that once again is after Ben claims there was a pause in global warming. The melting that's being reported here is a local phenomenon restricted to the southern polar region of Mars. It's not global, which is a bit surprising if it were the sun that was causing the melting. There is also an alternative explanation which was in the original paper about this uh, melting phenomenon, which is that major dust storm in the southern hemisphere coated the ice on the southern pole with dust, making it darker and melt more rapidly. Next we move out to Jupiter's big mystery, as Ben calls it, the case of the disappearing cloud belt. In 2010, the southern equatorial cloud belt on Jupiter disappeared. He implies that this is some unique event that's linked to solar warming, but provides no evidence of that. In fact, the evidence is to the contrary. The disappearance of this belt occurred at a time when the total solar radiance was at one of its lowest ebbs, so there is no possibility that the disappearance of this belt was fueled by an increase in solar heating. What Ben conveniently forgets to mention is that the belt returned within six months. Also in the article that he quotes, it is mentioned that the belt regularly does this. This is not a unique event, but this is quite a common event. But why wouldn't he mention that? Well, if you look at the dates, you can see that these disappearances have occurred during high and low periods of solar activity, which would destroy his link between high solar activity and global warming. Next, Ben latches on to the formation of a new storm on Jupiter, Red Junior, that he implies is once again caused by solar warming. Again, if you just look up the papers about this particular event, you'll find it's got quite a rich history, dating back to the 1930s. The formation of Red Junior, therefore, has been going on for about 80 years, and again cannot be associated with global warming. I think a pattern is emerging here. Now, some of the errors that Ben has made up to this point you could put down to being ignorant about the subject or just misinterpreting the articles or whatever. Here he has quoted articles that he has used to support his case, but omitted significant facts from those articles that would utterly destroy his case. This is not misinterpretation, this is misrepresentation. Now I could have spent a lot more time on the various points he made about the solar system warming, but in the interest of time I'll curtail the discussion here. Let's get to the crux of Ben's conclusions. Now remember that we've just shown in the three videos so far that in fact greenhouse gases are a likely cause of global warming, that the sun cannot be a cause of global warming, and that the solar system isn't warming as a whole. Now even if Ben were right on all of these issues, this next statement that he made at 24 minutes into the video is completely false. He says, This shift we are watching now is truly systematic throughout the solar system, leaving only extraplanetary electrical explanations. My question here is, where did electrical come from? He has presented no evidence so far that electricity has anything to do with any of these issues. He might as well have said, fairies caused this, or evil omens from the comet Ison. Perhaps unicorns were responsible, or the Force. Maybe it was the dolphins from the Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy, or perhaps even Lord Voldemort. He's presented exactly as much evidence that these things caused global warming as he has that electrical forces have caused global warming, i.e. none. Next Ben moves on to something that he calls one of the most embarrassing things in the history of science. Apparently an MIT program was written to create gibberish papers by scanning the internet for technical terms and mushing them all together into the structure of a scientific paper. Ben says that so many of them got published that one fictitious author became the 21st most cited scientist in the world and it concludes from all of this, so perhaps there is something amiss in science. Perhaps there would be something wrong in science if all this were true, but it isn't. As additional evidence, he brings up the case of Randy Sheckman, a Nobel laureate who has roundly criticised certain journals. Now Ben makes this sound as though he's abandoning all peer-reviewed journals, but that is in fact not the case. If you look up Sheckman's publications over the last year, he's published 13 papers in peer-reviewed journals. Well, the real issue is here is that Sheckman is the editor of a competing journal to the three that he has criticised, Science, Nature and Cell. So he can hardly be considered an unbiased party in this discussion. So let's get back to the case of the gibberish papers. That all sounded very bad, didn't it? But is it really? First of all, let's see who reported that there was a problem about this. The first reports came in Nature and Science magazine. 
the very journals that Randy Sheckman is complaining has too high editorial standards. Were these science papers in a science journal? No, they weren't. They were a conference proceedings for an engineering conference organized in China. This presents two problems. First of all, conference proceedings generally don't have very high refereeing standards. And secondly, you have the language debt barrier between the conference organizers and the scientists who are presenting papers in English. Secondly, they didn't use false names as Ben claims. They actually used the names of real scientists who were often surprised to find that they had written a paper on this subject at that conference. The other spoof articles that were published were published in open access journals, the exact sort of journal that Randy Sheckman is advocating. Lastly, Ben made it sound as though, because of these gibberish papers, a fictitious scientist became the 21st most cited scientist in the history of science. That is in fact not the case. It had nothing to do with the published gibberish papers, but somebody had hacked into a publication database and added the name of this fictitious scientist many times to the database. So it looked as though he had published a lot of papers, when in fact he had published none. Let me paraphrase Ben's closing comments. For those that can see the gaps in Ben's climate understanding, for those who can recognize the misguided current electric universe focus, you know the road to revelation. It's not buying an RV with other people's money, but buying some science books and getting to understand what you are talking about before standing up in front of a conference full of people and making yourself look like an idiot. Yeah.